Hello everyone, this is uh, the second panel of Oxford Arbitration Day. My name is Rafael Alves, I'll be the moderator of this panel today. We have a great lineup, lineup of speakers with several subtopics to discuss with you. Uh, I'll start with uh, Jane Jenkins. Uh, she's a partner and head of Fresh Roots Construction and Engineering team based in London with over 30 years of experience in complex construction disputes. The topic of this panel is complex construction arbitration, and I'm glad to have uh, great uh, colleagues here to discuss with you such topic and the subtopics. Jane uh, will talk about complex construction arbitrations in the COVID context, in the pandemic context. So Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, can I can I just confirm that my fellow speaker um, Sadaf is is also uh, online uh, because we are sharing our, our presentation to compare English law and UAE law, um, and in fact Sadaf was was going to kick off. Uh, I think uh, she's having some technical difficulties. I wonder if I could suggest that. We start with Rupert's sure. session. No problem, no problem, Jen. Thank, Thank you. I'll wait for Salaf to join. We're going to start with Rupert then. Uh, Rupert is a barrister, arbitrator, and mediator specialized in construction, engineering, and related areas at Atkin Chambers in London. Hi, Rupert. It's good to have you with us. Uh, Rupert will talk about the comparison between different models of uh, production, producing expert, and technical evidence and examining expert witness, witnesses in complex construction arbitrations. So Rupert, now the floor is yours. We changed the script so that you can start. Thank you, Raphael. And hello, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here um, in this wonderful year that is 2020 uh, on Friday the 13th. Um, what could possibly go wrong? Um, here, here I am to talk about um, expert evidence um, in complex uh, construction uh, arbitrations. And in the limited time I have of about 15 minutes, um, I, I've decided to try to answer the following four questions, um, which arise quite frequently. The, the first uh, question um, on the next slide, please, um, is the, the question of why for international disputes are tribunal appointed experts rare compared with party appointed experts? The second question, uh, which issues are common to tribunal appointed and party appointed experts? Third, why are there concerns about the independence of party appointed experts? And fourth, what are the pros and cons of getting party appointed experts together before and during the merits hearing? Moving on to the, the next uh, slide and starting try to answer my first question. Um, of course, the, the issue of when to appoint tribunal experts in complex construction arbitrations um, raises um, the, the first question of, well, what sort of circumstances might the tribunal do so? And there's a, a rather helpful document, certainly for the purposes of, of today's discussion, uh, produced by the ICC um, concerning specifically construction industry arbitrations, which comments on this. And you'll see on the slide I've quoted from uh, paragraph 18.5 of that report, which offers three examples or situations when the tribunal might appoint its own uh, experts. Uh, and as you'll see from these examples, they're really quite narrow um, and I think begin to explain why uh, tribunal appointed experts are so rare. 
So the first is if the parties have not provided adequate technical information. But well, of course, there are other ways in which that can be resolved uh, apart from calling upon a tribunal expert. Secondly, where the assessment of part of the case might take a considerable amount of time. So, for example, where you have complex delay analysis. Um, again, one might ask whether the tribunal indeed would want to appoint an expert as the solution for dealing with that issue, as opposed to requiring the party appointed experts uh, to clarify matters and help with the assessment. Thirdly, where the opinions of experts uh, are important and any differences are not attributable to different perceptions of the facts. Well, again, uh, one might seek to push the party appointed experts to be clear on uh, alternative opinions rather than uh, deferring to appointing one's own expert as a tribunal. And so that's why I say these, these three examples that are given are, are, are helpful indicators, but I think also show uh, why um, by themselves um, the appointment of experts by a tribunal tends to be quite rare. But let's look on the next slide at some of the other reasons um, why I think tribunal appointed experts are rare, particularly in complex construction arbitrations. Uh, the, the first reason I would offer is that frequently it is hard for a tribunal to identify if it would even help to have its own expert, uh, for example, as indicated on the previous slide, until it is too late to do so. Um, it may be quite close to the merits hearing itself that the tribunal um, might have a fuller picture as to what the, the case is all about and whether it might indeed want a tribunal appointed expert. Um, but then, of course, it would be too late um, to appoint one. The second reason I would offer is that usually um, not only do you end up then with three experts if the tribunal chooses to appoint one in addition to the parties having their uh, own of, on particular disciplines. But usually you'll, you'll find then a whole set of other issues uh, are opened up before uh, you if, if you are the tribunal and, and if you are the parties on the parties trying to help the tribunal. And I've sort of set out some of those issues there, but I would highlight one of those, which is the bottom one, which is how, if you appoint a tribunal appointed expert, do you set up a process to avoid the tribunal in effect delegating part of its uh, decision making function to that tribunal appointed expert. So due process concerns loom large if the tribunal starts to engage their own expert evidence beyond that from the parties. So it, 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 may, it may be that appointing a tribunal expert is, is seen as a solution to some problems but equally may then create uh, others. So again, another reason why some tribunals, many tribunals, certainly in complex construction arbitrations, uh, might shy away from having uh, their own uh, experts, particularly if they are in addition to those of parties. And the final, more practical reason I would give as to why tribunal appointed experts are rare in complex construction arbitrations is, is simply the fact that often the tribunal lacks the time and or the inclination um, to engage with the challenges of appointing its own uh, expert. Um, and so for, for all those reasons, and there are no doubt others, um, in, in answer to my first question, why are they, uh, why are tribunal appointed experts rare compared with party appointed experts? The, the reasons are many and it, it's, it's harder to see how that situation might change, uh, certainly when one is talking about uh, complex construction arbitrations. Moving then on to my next slide and, and the second question, uh, which issues are common to tribunal appointed and party appointed uh, experts? Uh, again, I, I have a list of items, but in, for time reasons, I will focus only on a few and I will focus on the two on this slide. Um, in practice, if 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 one is looking to appoint an expert, whether as a as a party or as a tribunal, uh, one issue that arises in some jurisdictions, at least, or where the seat of the arbitration is in some jurisdictions, is whether the appointment should be limited to experts who are uh, listed on some formal database, uh, who have some form of uh, accreditation, um, and 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 whether that that provides the, the pool of experts that one should be selecting from. 
or whether, as is the case in, in I think, the vast majority of jurisdictions, whether uh, the tribunal has free reign and whether the parties have free reign as to where they uh, go to identify uh, an appropriate expert uh, or experts. The second uh, issue that one needs to consider, whether being at a tribunal or a party appointing an expert, is the very important um, factor, certainly in, in complex construction arbitrations, of identifying and defining the issues for the expert. And this arises in a number of ways. First, of course, one needs to know what issues arise for an expert in order to then try to choose the expert. And there can be a degree to which uh, there's an iterative process, a bit of chicken and egg, if you like, where identifying the issues actually does involve engaging with, at least initially, with some experts to be clear, certainly in technical fields, as to whether they are of the right discipline and whether the issues that one thinks as a lawyer are the issues uh, are in fact the correct issues and therefore whether you're fishing in the right expert pond, as it were. The other aspect of identifying the issues, which I think is important in complex construction arbitrations, is that when it comes to actually instructing the expert, too often in, in my experience, the expert is left unclear or not properly guided as to quite what the particular issues arising for their opinion are. And that's sadly often manifested at the merits hearing stage, as, as, late, as late on as that, when it becomes apparent that apparent, seemingly corresponding experts for the different parties of the same discipline uh, are actually answering different questions or addressing different issues. Now, this should be capable of being identified early on. Certainly, I think it's good practice for tribunals to persuade the parties uh, to provide lists of issues as, as early as they can. And those lists of issues have other benefits, for example, when if and when dealing with Redfern schedules and the disclosure process. But certainly in the expert uh, context, uh, lists of issues are I think, very helpful um, in ensuring or trying to ensure that experts uh, are engaging on the same matters um, as far in advance of the final hearing uh, as, as possible. Uh, and of course, there are other pointers along the way. For example, it's often expected that the experts should set out in their reports um, the instructions that they are given, um, which of course is, is, is something that um, would naturally happen with any tribunal appointed expert, but certainly with party appointed experts um, it is something that, that many rules like the IBA rules, as I've indicated on the slide, uh, require at least in terms of um, a description of those instructions rather than necessarily um, providing them uh, verbatim. Connected with that, I, I would also highlight the importance, I think, of uh, experts being clear as to the facts that they are assuming in order to reach their opinions, because again, one finds, sadly, in practice, that often one of the reasons that experts, by the time of the merits hearing, have different opinions on matters uh, may turn on simply the assumptions that they have formed on the facts rather than um, any real difference in terms of uh, the technical side of the case, such that if you uh, ask the experts uh, to assume the same facts, one might find actually their opinions um, are the same. Moving now, if I may, on to the next slide, simply for uh, completeness, I've set out some other more obvious, I think, issues that are common um, when appointing experts, both as a tribunal and as a party. Um, obviously, things like expertise and availability, uh, perhaps slightly less obvious things, you may want to uh, check whether uh, experts uh, that you are considering have been criticised um, openly, for example, in court judgments, uh, or have written anything um, that's been published, uh, which is adverse uh, to the likelihood of their opinions being accepted um, in the arbitration. Um, so those are other things that may be considered, and of course the burden can be put on the experts you are considering to let you know whether in fact um, any of these things are relevant, whether any of these things have happened, rather than you going off and trying to carry out some open-ended research by yourself. So those are the issues which I would suggest are common to 
tribunal appointed and party appointed experts, and I hope give some indicator of do's and don'ts um, in in this uh, area. Moving on now to my third question, which is one which I find crops up a lot, um, certainly from those less experienced with dealing with party appointed experts, which is, can they ever really be truly independent? Um, or the way I phrased it here, why are there concerns about the independence of party appointed experts? Of course, the starting point for this is an assumption that party appointed experts should be independent, and that is a generally uh, held view, but not a universally held one um, in the uh, construction arbitration uh, world. And I've cited there the IBA rules, which um, certainly envisage when they apply um, that being the case. But look at the Prague rules, the, the, the recent arrival of the Prague rules, um, seeking to rebalance uh, the types of procedures that are used in uh, international arbitrations with more of a civil law uh, slant. The working group for the Prague rules uh, said this, that quotes, many commentators express doubts as to the impartiality of party appointed experts, close quotes. Now, see, there's a, strictly speaking, a distinction between impartiality and independence, but for these purposes, um, I, I, I will run with, with that concern, which as I say, is a concern I've heard express myself a number of times. Um, before moving on from the Prague rules, I should highlight that they focus on tribunal appointed experts, but do recognise, despite the, the doubts mentioned by the working group, that party appointed experts may also be um, appointed. Um, but rather curiously, um, there isn't an express requirement in the Prague rules for impartiality or independence. That, that may simply be an oversight that no doubt will be corrected in future editions of the Prague rules. But let's let's turn to these concerns and, and perhaps analyze them, break them down a bit. Before doing so, the overarching point, of course, that should be made uh, regarding party appointed experts is that there is naturally a, a tension, if not a temptation, uh, given the aim regarding any party appointed experts being to have your expert's opinion preferred over that of the opponents. And that tension can be manifested in a number of ways. If we can go to the next slide, we can see a couple of uh, examples. Um, first of all, again, quoting the ICC report, an issue commonly arising in construction is that one finds that the experts who appear in arbitrations, uh, who are, are put forward as being independent experts, may actually have been involved a lot earlier in the case, when in the, the dispute. Uh, when advancing claims or defences on behalf of one of the parties. And at that stage, we're not um, purporting at least to be acting in an independent way, but now have transformed into a situation where they are, uh, and of course may still be holding to the same views. That of course is a, is a, is, is a, 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 a very live issue when one is considering the evidence of those people and is a point highlighted um, in the ICC report um, and, and commonly crops up in, in the construction context. Second um, area of concern regarding independence, uh, that again I've seen surprisingly often, given it does seem rather obvious that it's, it's, it's problematic, which is where an expert's uh, payment is in some way connected with the results of the dispute. And clearly that's um, contradictory to the experts' um, independence, but as I say, surprisingly, it does crop up um, more often than you would expect. Third area, if we look at the next slide, please, um, concerns the selection stage with experts. And again, um, this is something I find occurs a lot in the construction context, particularly uh, when dealing with the technical uh, aspects of the case, perhaps more so than when dealing with delay or quantum, for example which is where one um, might be said to be shopping around for an expert uh, that suits the part of the case that has the technical aspects in order to find somebody that has an opinion more likely to uh, support uh, your case on that um, aspect. Now, of course, one shouldn't ever be doing this when um, seeking to appoint an arbitrator, and it's, it's, clear, it's clearly uh, 
regard international news inappropriate to ask arbitrators which way they might view certain issues in a case. But rather curiously, in 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 the guidelines that, that one has out there, for example, the IBA guidelines on party representation, one doesn't see an analogous um, prohibition on parties asking experts at the selection or interview stage what their views are on the technical or other issues that they might be asked to uh, opine on. And that does seem to me to be a rather uh, glaring omission from from those guidelines and, and similar uh, guidelines. Turning now to the fourth um, aspect of uh, independence on the next slide, please. Um, the issue of repeat appointments, which again is something that arises a lot in construction, um, where certainly with delay and quantum, there are a number of quite large firms uh, that provide a lot of um, experts that can help with these types of uh, area uh, of dispute. And it's not uncommon to find uh, parties and law firms uh, repeatedly appointing from the same uh, organization for their delay and quantum experts in, in particular. Now, again, one might draw an analogy with the, the appointment of arbitrators where the IBA uh, guidelines on, on conflicts of interest would expect an arbitrator if they have obtained repeat appointments uh, from a party or from a, a law firm uh, to uh, disclose those so that both parties know where they stand, particularly, of course, the other party, and um, a view can be taken on, on that matter. Uh, that is, though, again, something which is not expressly referred to in the guidelines as I've seen internationally, uh, and again, might be regarded regarding experts, and again, might be considered uh, an omission um, when it comes to party appointed um, experts um, who have been repeatedly appointed by the same party or by um, the same firm. Now let's look briefly at a, a, a recent English judgment, English court judgment on a, uh, a related topic um, where, if we can move on to the next slide please, um, where uh, earlier this year the English uh, High Court considered a situation which again arises in the construction context quite commonly because of the multiple contracts uh, one has. And the situation here is where uh, a contractor arbitrated against his employer uh, and alleged uh, the various latencies in, in drawings and the employer uh, engaged uh, a firm of experts called firm a for these purposes um, who provided expert evidence to defend that arbitration uh, but under a separate contract a, a second arbitration was commenced against the same employer um, and the arbitration in that case um, concerned or gave rise to similar issues as the first arbitration about late design information this time from the, the, the claimant um, well, again from the claimant um, and the employer um, wanted uh, to obviously use the same experts, but in any event had to say had the concern that uh, the consultant claiming in that second arbitration um, was engaging experts from the same group um, that provided uh, experts to it. And the long and short of it was that the the High Court uh, injuncted, so restrained uh, the consultant in arbitration two from using experts from the same firm uh, as. Uh, the employer had used. Uh, and as one will see from that, um, that potentially opens up um, or potentially has quite significant consequences uh, in the context certainly of construction, the construction world where one has these large organizations that provide um, multiple delay and quantum experts uh, and uh, parties who may be involved in multiple arbitrations who, who choose experts from the same uh, firm. So clearly quite some significant consequences um, if that approach were to be followed, um, and not just in this jurisdiction, but in, in other jurisdictions as well. Moving on now, if I may, to the, the next uh, consideration regarding on the uh, independence or concerns about the independence of party appointed uh, experts is the drafting of expert reports. Now, of course, the, the guidelines require that the experts report is uh, product um, 
of the expert and reflects the expert's opinions. But one can see from some documents, uh, some respectable uh, authoritative documents, that it's recognized that um, the legal team may have some level of input uh, into the production of the expert report and the drafting of it. So for example, uh, the the English law text uh, entitled expert evidence, which I've set out on the bottom of this slide, um, says that lawyers may quote, suggest a form of words to the expert as opposed to drafting large parts of the report, provided that it was clear, made clear to the expert that he was free to accept or reject this suggestion. And one can see how practices such as these may be seen by some at least uh, unfamiliar with party appointed experts as impinging upon the independence um, of the expert and as a result um, one can understand why those concerns may exist. Um, this though for those who are well familiar with the use of party appointed experts um, is, 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 is regarded as perfectly normal. Um, and of course, returning full circle to where we were uh, earlier with tribunal appointed experts, of course, none of none of these points um, would be expected to arise. Um, and these are all very specific uh, issues um, that crop up under this general umbrella of independence of party appointed experts. Turning now to my, my final question, um, the use of uh, party appointed experts before and during the merits hearing. Uh, in short, um, this is seen in the complex construction arbitration world as being generally a, a good thing to have the experts try to narrow the issues between them uh, before the merits hearing and moreover at the merits hearing to have them giving their evidence um, together to try to ensure that uh, there is no mismatch uh, between the facts that they're assuming, for example, and that the proper comparisons can be drawn between their evidence. So I think I'll, I'll lead you, because time is against me, to read those last two slides for yourselves. Um, but in short, the, the getting together of party appointed experts, I think, is is by and large uh, a beneficial uh, thing in terms of time and cost, both when that is done before uh, the merits hearing and when it's done at the merits hearing. So there we are. That's that's all I had uh, to say on expert evidence and those four questions and at some point I'll be very happy to uh, engage with everyone um, on the issues arising or any other issues concerning experts in the complex arbitration world. Thank you Rupert. Uh, since we have resolved the technical issue with SADAF, in the benefit of time I will pass the floor directly to Jane and SADAF. Jane, I will introduce you again if that is okay. Uh, so Jane Jenkins is a partner and head of Fresh Shoots Construction Engineering Team based in London with over 30 years of experience in complex construction disputes. Sadaf Habib is an arbitrator and an associate with Bill in Company, Dubai office, with over 10 years of experience working in international arbitration and particularly construction disputes in the Middle East. Uh, so Sadaf, the floor is yours. Uh, as I mentioned before, the topic of Sadaf and Jane is, uh, is complex construction arbitrations in the COVID context, uh, a very trendy discussion <laughs> that we had uh, and we're going to have again uh, later on in, in Oxford uh, Arbitration Day and the other banners of Oxford Arbitration Day. But even so, we're going to uh, frame this discussion of the, the pandemic context within the uh, complex construction arbitration context in this panel. So Sadaf, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Raphael, for the introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting us today to present at this conference. We have enjoyed collaborating and putting together our presentation. Uh, if I can move, if we can move to the next slide to see our agenda. So given the short time that we have available, that is 25 minutes with 10 minutes for questions from our fellow panelists, what Jane and I are looking to do is to cover the key legal doctrines under English law and UAE law of frustration, force majeure and hardship. And just to draw out points of comparison between some of these doctrines and see how they apply in terms of the COVID-19 context. 
We're also hoping, to, time permitting, to briefly address the approach of tribunals, the ICC, the UK government guidance, and the English courts in relation to disputes, both in terms of impact on the procedure of determining these disputes and the strong messages that are encouraged, that is to encourage parties to settle. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Very beautiful pictures of ourselves, I must say, Jane. <laughs> we will be sharing the presentation with Jane, who's going to be leading on the English law points and myself on UE law. I will now hand over to Jane to take you through COVID-19 and its effects on projects. Thank you. If we could have the, the next slide, please. And just uh, step over to the next one as well. Thank you. So uh, we saw the immediate effects on projects uh, involved uh, where Chinese contractors and suppliers were involved as early as last year. Um, and those uh, FX escalated rapidly as the pandemic uh, moved uh, across the world. So we saw dislocation of the supply chain uh, with major programs being halted and delayed factories, borders, airports, uh, all closed. So key people could not travel, as well as the difficulty in shipping uh, equipment and supplies. So inevitably that had an effect on delay and disruption projects leading to claims for compensation and extensions of time. There were requirements, and we will work through this as we address the legal doctrines, to address workaround measures to mitigate the effects. And then there was a question of entitlement to recover those increased costs. And there is a particularly acute risk of insolvency for mid and low tier suppliers. Certainly the UK government was very conscious of this and issued instructions to the public sector to continue making payments to contractors, to maintain essential public services. The government's also ordered manufacturing capability to be diverted to essential PPE equipment, which again had a knock-on impact on contracts. So if we could move to the next slide. The question then is uh, what, what legal remedies are available in these circumstances? Um, so uh, English law, you know, the touch points uh, are frustration and supervening illegality and force majeure, of course. Um, and now I will hand over to Sadaf to address the UAE law and alternatives. So thanks, Jane. So under UAE law, we have two key legal concepts that we see that parties have tried to bring their COVID-19 claims and just to assess their position in relation to, to these aspects. And that is, one is force majeure and the second one is hardship. And that is what we will explore in more detail. If we can look at the next slide, thank you. So just to touch on a few points of comparison between English and UAE law, which is quite interesting. So, under, so force majeure under UAE law and frustration under English law create the same result, and that is the contract is cancelled. Now, this raises the question, is it a blunt instrument where both parties want to complete the project to simply cancel the contract? Does it create an opportunity for the contractor to possibly escape a bad bargain? Can the contractor use it in such a way? Now, just because a contract is more expensive, that does not, necess that does not give rise to force majeure under English law and UAE law. And we will look at this in detail. Depending on the contract terms, the event relied upon must prevent or hinder performance. The additional expense, if there is an additional expense that is created, this is not a test that applies under either system of law. However, interestingly, under the UAE law, there is a principle of hardship, which contractors or parties can look to get some sort of relief. But under both systems of law, there may be better solutions under the terms of the contract or insurance. If we can look at the next slide. Thank you. So the first 
point and um, Jane and I'm sure our panelists would agree is that when a client comes to you with an issue related to COVID-19 the first thing to look at is whether the contract offers what kind of relief does the contract offer and what is the party's position under the contract. Now common provisions that we have been looking and discussing with our clients include changing law provisions, right to amend and suspend supply, insurance which I will leave Jane to look at in detail under English law, rights to terminate, extensions of time, and price adjustment mechanisms. Just to give a slightly practical example of the, the kind of situation that can come up, for example, we had a developer, and this was sort of April, May, so just at the point when the pandemic was, you know, in full swing at that time, and we had a developer come to us asking if we can, if he can, if they can suspend the, the works for 14 days. Now, it is a FIDIC red book, so we looked to the suspension provision in the contract and the suspension, the, the suspension clause allows the employer to suspend at, at will, basically. But obviously that would attract a claim, potential claim for extension of time and cost as well from the contractor. So those are the kind of provisions that you see. And similarly for the contractor, the contractor would want to see, okay, yes, we have this COVID-19 event. How is it affecting the progress of the project in terms of delay, you know, putting in your time claims, your cost claims under the contract. So your contract is basically your first point of call. If we can look at the next slide. Sorry, do you want me to touch on insurance? Should we just skip back to the previous slide? Yeah, sure. uh, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah, so, but basically it may be uh, that uh, the contract provides for mandatory insurance to be taken out. This is certainly the norm under um, English contracts, English law contracts. So you'd expect the contractors to take out contractors or risk insurance, also employers liability insurance. And there may be other specific insurances. Uh, now, what you don't often see, certainly in my experience, is a requirement as part of contractors or risk for business interruption insurance. Um, it may be carried by contractors or suppliers at the head office level uh, or to cover manufacturing facilities, for example, or it may be an element of a project specific policy, particularly where works are to an existing structure. Uh, an existing operating facility or, or where project finance is involved, where the lenders are wanting to know whether there will be protection in that event. Uh, and there may be other relevant uh, insurances in place depending on the contract. So, you know, what Sadaf said is obviously the, the starting point. You look at the terms of the contract and, and you consider all potential remedies. Um, now, the case that we've mentioned here is a test case which the Financial Conduct Authority brought before the English High Court on behalf of small and medium enterprises in the wake of the government's comments that the insurance industry should cover the pandemic under business interruption policies. So the uh, insured, the insur those who were insured were seeking cover under their policies and finding that the insurers were actually refusing to pay out. So the FCA brought this test case. And essentially the uh, approach is instructive uh, by analogy for the purposes of uh, looking at construction projects, despite the fact that I, I made the point that building into, uh, sorry, business interruption insurance may not be the norm but where it is instructive is that the way the court approached the analysis was to look at the chronological evolution of the government guidance the emergency regulations that were put in place and considered on a time slice basis the effect that those had for the purposes of questions of coverage under the policies so first of all, we had regulations in March, which introduced the social distancing requirements. We then had amendments to those regulations in April, which required certain businesses to close. Now, construction sites were never included in that, but nevertheless, there was then guidance issued by the Construction Leadership Council, which introduced um, 
requirements for uh, health and safety plans to address the use of PPE, to address social distancing, to address uh, shift work to ensure that those social distancing measures should be could be achieved, and also sanitary measures such as hand washing facilities on the site. So applying that by analogy to a force majeure claim, I think we can expect that the way the courts will look at things is by taking the chronology and addressing how the uh, regulations and the laws impacted on construction works as the regulations hardened uh, and, and as the circumstances changed from time to time in the ability for businesses to deal with these issues uh, and to be able to respond and put workaround measures in place. So perhaps if we could go to the next slide. Yeah, frustration uh, under English law. Um, this is a very, very narrowly applied doctrine and it is extremely difficult for parties to um, get themselves within the conditions. Essentially, there has to be a supervening event without the fault of either party, where the risk is not completely allocated by the contract or provided for by the contract. It must significantly change the nature and not just the expense or difficulty of the outstanding contractual performance in a way that the parties could not reasonably have contemplated such that it would be unjust to hold them to the original bargain. So essentially, it is a different contract that's, or a different manner of performance, which is required in the change circumstances. Um, now, given that time is short, what we have done is to include in an annex um, the relevant principles from the leading cases uh, under English law and the UAE civil code provisions. So I'm going to leave it there, but please do have reference to those um, should you wish to unpack uh, these conditions in, in more detail. So next slide, please. So, like I said at the outset, the um, doctrine of frustration under English law and force majeure under UE law have the same effect in that they both cancel, the ultimate effect is cancellation of the contract. Now, force majeure is captured in Article 273 of the UE Civil Code. The provision is set out in the annex chair to our slides, just as Jane mentioned. Now, the key requirement under this provision is that the performance should have become impossible. Now, a UE civil court, so like I said, the starting point is the party's contract. So you'd first look at the force majeure provision in the party's contract. How widely or how narrowly is it defined? If there is no force majeure provision and if it's a UE contract, then you would turn to look at the UE civil court. Now, the civil court does not define force majeure. So this, has, this was left to the UE courts to do. And the UE courts do not, uh, so the principle of stare decisis does not apply here. So we don't have the system of binding precedents. In that sense, a judge can, one judge can decide, I mean, you can have two judges reach completely different outcomes. But having said that, when it comes to force majeure, the UE courts have taken a narrow approach and they've come up with certain criteria which should exist in order for an event to be force majeure. And that is that the event must have been unforeseeable. It must amount to more than just a hardship. The event must have been unavoidable. And it is beyond the defaulting party's control. And like I said, the effect of force majeure is to cancel the contract. If we can look at the next slide. So this is now ad addressing the position under English law. Um, interestingly, uh, by comparison with UAE law, the event does not need to be unforeseeable. Uh, but under English law, the critical point is that there is uh, no doctrine of force majeure under statute, nor generally applied by virtue of common law. It has to be written into the contract. 
Uh, and the first question is then whether you have a defined event of force majeure which caused the failure to perform. The event, was it within the party's control? If so, it doesn't amount to force majeure. Could they have overcome the event? And it may be that there are notice requirements which may be conditions precedent to recover. I think we should move on because I know another panel is going to address force majeure and I, I think it'd be important for us to look at it in the context of a construction dispute. So next slide, please. So the second remedy under UAE law is hardship. Now, hardship is captured in Article 249 of the UAE Civil Code. The two key points to establish hardship is that okay, it should be a public, it should be circumstances of public nature, which could not have been foreseen as a result of performance. And the second thing is that it should make the performance of an obligation more onerous, so as to threaten the obliger with grave loss. This is quite similar to the French cops concept of imprevision, and pardon my French, I'm sure I got the pronunciation wrong. But um, yeah, so these are the two main elements of hardship. Now, how is this different to force majeure under UAE law? Well, first of all, force majeure under UAE law means that it should be impossible to perform the contract. When we're talking about hardship, it's still possible to perform your obligation, but it's just become more onerous to do so. The second way it differs from force majeure is the effect. So force majeure cancels the contract, whereas if you have hardship, then the judge has this discretion to reduce the oppressive obligation. And they say to a reasonable level if justice so requires. So it's at the, just, it's at the judge's discretion. Now, practically speaking, I personally have not seen the judge, I've not seen a judge sort of reduce and get into the party's contract to reduce an obligation. So I'll be really interested to see once we start getting like this flow of COVID-19 claims into the courts, how the courts actually deal with this. Um, I'll just hand back to Jane. So um, applying these principles in the, the C-19 context, um, I mean, there may be various events that can be relied upon, uh, but the question really is, what is the dominant or most proximate cause? I have to say that in, in, in my practice, I've tended to be acting for employers resisting claims, and it has been very easy to do so, I have to say, because of the lack of specificity that the claimants have brought to explaining precisely what is the event, precisely what measures they took to be able to work around that event, and to demonstrate that it was that event which did indeed cause the inability to perform the contract. In some instances, for example, there was pre-existing delay which we were able to point to. Um, there were instances where a contractor was seeking to rely on a change of law in order to claim a variation under the terms of the contract. But the change of law clause addressed change in domestic law, and they were seeking to rely on foreign law. So it was essentially uh, regulations which had prevented the release of supplies because of customs quarantine provisions in another country. So the kind of events that can be relied upon, um, obviously, if you're looking at force majeure, the starting point is what does the force majeure clause say? Is there a reference to pandemic? Um, in some instances, in the contracts I was advising on, that there was, or, or at least to epidemics. Um, is it a shortage of staff because of illness or inability to travel? I've mentioned the quarantine rules, which were relevant in one of my cases. And I've also touched on the government legislation. Uh, there's also been government guidance, which of itself does not amount to a change in law directly. Uh, but an argument that um, certainly we were alive to was whether that would determine or influence the obligations of employers towards their workers under the Health and Safety Act such that it would effectively amount to a change in law, given the content of that guidance and the need under the CDM regulations to address a health and safety plan. 
So those are just some of the examples of the, the points that we looked at. Um, Sadaf is going to address uh, a number more. If we could go to the next slide, please. So when we're looking at our applying the principles in a C19 context, first of all, we need to consider what evidence is there of workaround measures and efforts to mitigate the event and its consequences. So remember we said that to claim force majeure performance should be impossible. So for example, if a contractor is claiming force majeure because his supply chain is affected, maybe he can consider alternative supply sources and did he do so? If social distancing is a problem, maybe shift working to reduce the number of employees on site at any one time. And of course, adjusting the program to revise the critical path. The other point to consider was there pre-existing delay. Is that the dominant cause of failure to meet obligations? Now, we stress the importance of records, and I'm sure my panelists and especially Jane would agree that it's paramount to keep your records in order, especially when we're looking to bring your claims to arbitration or even to present your claims as a contractor to the employer. You know, the more detailed, the more precise you've documented and logged in your delay, the better it is. Specificity, of course, without a doubt, make them as specific and particular as possible. Time windows may be impossible to mitigate during one time window, but maybe not as it progresses, as time progresses. If we can look at so, the next slide. Sorry, Jane. No, no, next slide, please. <laughs> I was very much anticipating your comment. So I've already made the point that um, is the risk provided for in the contract? So in some contracts I looked at, as I said, pandemic and disease was addressed, or it may be general language, an event beyond the control. Um, in relation to frustration on a long-term project, it's very unlikely that disruption caused by C-19 will be sufficient to frustrate and the principal EPC or EPCM contract. For example, on oil and gas redevelopment projects that we're working on, the time frame for those projects um, stretch it for, to four or five years. So although there has been significant disruption during this year, it is still not uh, of the kind to frustrate um, a contract of that length. Now, it doesn't follow that that would be the case for a supply contract for a piece of equipment where time is of the essence. For example, to meet a weather window on, on a major oil and gas project of that kind in Kazakhstan, for example, where the waterways freeze up and it's not possible to ship equipment at certain times of year. So there isn't one size that fits all to these questions. You obviously have to look at the factual circumstances and apply the doctrines and the contractual terms in their context. So to the next slide, please. And again, if you could move on. So what we have seen so far is that a lot of um, contractors are bringing in their pre-C19 claims. So it's not, we haven't seen COVID-19 related claims, so to speak, come to arbitration as of now. So they're more looking at the delay that was existing before, their cost claims, and that too, they're taking a somewhat, initially it was a somewhat cautious approach, and now claims have really started kicking in. So what I'm curious to see is maybe, well, I expect, I personally expect that sort of next year is when we'll start seeing COVID related claims coming in to disputes. The other effect that we saw during this period is this whole virtual hearings idea, because before COVID-19 in the UAE, it wasn't, I mean, I don't recall ever discussing with any colleague the possibility of having a virtual arbitration hearing. Now, luckily for us, two years ago, we had our federal arbitration law that came into place, and that allows an arbitral tribunal to host, to be able to, yeah, to allow virtual hearings to take place, but obviously with the parties' agreement. The difficulties that did arise with this was especially when it came to witness cross-examination, and uh, in fact, uh, a colleague of mine told me about uh, witness, there was with possibility of witness tampering in, in an arbitration that he attended. And um, eventually they had one party's, a colleague from the other party attend with the witness in the same room, keeping social distancing measures in place. So there's this question whether virtual hearings are suitable to construction disputes. 
Now, the thing with electronic awards, I'll just quickly make a point, is that what we saw was initially, especially with the lockdown, was that centers were not accepting hard copies of um, awards. And the go around to this was that arbitral tribunals would, if the parties agreed, issue an electronically signed award. But what I found, in fact, a case where I was sitting as arbitrator, the respondent just completely refused. So in that case, it delayed issuance of the award. And these are just some of the impacts that we saw in terms of disp construction disputes in the UAE. Uh, I think you can move on to the next slide. Yes, I, I, we, I thought it would be useful to see what the ICC uh, is, is addressing and or has experienced in terms of COVID-19 claims. Um, and interestingly, there, there was uh, a conference yesterday, many of you may have dialed in, and there was a session uh, which addressed COVID-19 with a fair amount of focus on virtual hearings, it must be said. Uh, but what, what they did, uh, there was a survey that was conducted, uh, and what they did provide at the outset was um, a snapshot of what they've been seeing, which is a step up in claims um, initially, and then there was a, a certain lull before they picked up again. It surprised them to learn that uh, the parties were not using mediation as much as they had expected. Uh, and what we've included on this slide is reference to a YouTube clip um, earlier in the year where the ICC Academy were recognizing that settlement of claims may be the most attractive option for parties. Uh, and of course, that mediation is available under the auspices of the ICC rules. They also commented that arbitrators could promote settlement, uh, which is quite a controversial area, of course. Um, but the, the tools that they were proposing was bifurcation, such as separating liability and damages and looking at preliminary issues as to governing law so that the parties could then go away and consider uh, whether to proceed with the arbitration in the light of partial awards. And then active engagement of the arbitral tribunal, which requires agreement between the parties and the applicable law to permit the tribunal facilitating settlement. We, we don't, certainly from Anglo-Saxon point of view, have the same approach as you see in Asia to MEDARB. There was also a comment made that if there was no force majeure clause and the gov contracts governing law uh, had not been identified and there were no specific provisions concerning force majeure, the tribunal could be inclined to adopt the unidoc principles. Um, and again, I, I think from the perspective of English law, if there was a contract governed by English law and there was no force majeure clause, the argument I would make very strongly is that the parties had turned their mind to that and decided that no relief should be available. And it would not be appropriate in those circumstances for the unidoc principles to apply. So perhaps if we can quickly go to the next uh, slide, um, I just want to say very briefly that the, the UK issued guidance to all businesses to encourage settlement and adjustment or accommodation within contractual arrangements rather than recourse to intractable disputes. And indeed, some of the industry bodies have come forward with fast track dispute resolution procedures adapted specifically to the COVID situation. Um, there are links there uh, to those. I, I won't dwell on them now. The final slide um, addresses various cases before the TCC. These do not substantively address questions of the application of force majeure or frustration. Rather, they are all procedural cases. And the, the essential thrust of the approach of the court is that the show will go on. So while parties were trying to rely on C-19 to say that hearings had to be postponed or that judgment should not be enforced, the overriding message from the courts was no, uh, we're having virtual hearings. Um, you can proceed on, on the normal time frame, And it's only in exceptional circumstances uh, was the court prepared to provide relief. So that's all we wanted to address. But of course, Sadaf and I will be back to answer questions uh, to the extent there's time at the end of this session. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Sadaf, for this great uh, presentation on comparative law. 
And in the benefit of time, we're gonna pass on the floor to Gustavo directly. Gustavo, are you there? So Gustavo Schaeffer da Silveira is a counsel at uh, Taurian Shecker, associated with Mayor Brown. And Gustavo's uh, topics today is set of claims in the context of complex construction arbitration. Gustavo, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafael. Before I start, we quickly like to thank the organizers. I'm uh, very pleased to be part of this panel and, and these interesting discussions. Complex construction arbitration. So we we often hear that uh, construction disputes are complex by nature, and that is uh, often true. This complexity can come from several aspects, and sometimes we will even find all of these aspects together in the same uh, disputes, such as technical complexity, political, procedural, legal, etc. Complexity may also of multiple multiple claims related to the same contract, uh, to the same project. And I think that uh, this is the most classic type of uh, complexity when uh, we read about uh, construction disputes. And I would like to look at the issue of complex construction arbitration uh, from this last aspect, the existence of uh, multiple contracts and multiple claims, but from a very precise uh, issue, the issue of set of claims. And first, in the context of one multi-tiered dispute resolution clause with several uh, claims. And second, in the context of a uh, set of claims based in uh, two or more arbitration agreements. Construction um, disputes can have a lot of variables that are not known to the parties uh, when they sign their contracts. And, and for this reason, it's very difficult for them to pre-choose one single dispute resolution mechanism that will be adapted or well adapted to each one of these variables. For instance, uh, depending on, on the type of dispute, the parties may want to put the emphasis on amicable resolution or quick resolution, creation of a, a precedent, among other uh, uh, interests that they may have. We see that uh, construction disputes, they require flexibility and adaptability for their uh, efficient resolution. And this is why the FIDIC for a while now has adopted a uh, multi-tiered dispute resolution system that's basically formed by the engineer, the DAAB and arbitration. And this system has the advantage of putting forward uh, different mechanisms at the different stages of the dispute, leaving arbitration as a last resort. So arbitration would be reserved only for those disputes that were uh, not resolved by the previous TS. The point is that for this system to be efficient, uh, it has to be applied strictly. And in practice, it may have some, uh, the parties may face some difficulties. In the FIDIC system, for instance, the fact that one dispute has already been submitted to the DAB and it's now being brought before the arbitrators does not mean that the other disputes may jump the dispute board and go straight to arbitrations. The parties will have to be proactive. If one party starts to submit claims and disputes to the engineer and to the dispute board, the other party should quickly assess its position and uh, submit its claims and disputes as well. But we see in practice that it's not rare that during an arbitration procedure, respondent discover new claims and that respondent tries to raise these new claims and request the set off of these claims against, the, against claimant's claims. If these set off uh, claims have not been submitted to the previous years, they will very likely be considered inadmissible uh, in the arbitration. And ICC case 14709 gives a very good example of this situation. In, in, in this ICC case, the arbitral tribunal analyzed the dispute resolution clause and considered that there was an obligation to submit disputes to an expert, which in the clause the parties called an adjudicator, but by interpreting the clause, the arbitrator 
decided it was uh, the notion of an expert. And only after disputes were submitted to this expert, they could be filed uh, in the arbitration. And the arbitral tribunal considered that the obliga this obligation to submit disputes first to the expert applied both to the principal claims and to the so-called set-off claims. And he noted that it would be illogical to consider that the, the solution should vary according to who presented the claim, claimant or um, respondent. So the arbitral tribunal decided that respondents' claims, may they be called counterclaims or set-off claims, would only be admissible after being submitted to uh, the expert. One important thing to notice here is that it's not the counterclaim or the set-off claim that has to be submitted independently to the previous years to arbitration. The, the, the real requirement is that the dispute to which uh, the set-off claim or the counterclaim is related uh, has been submitted uh, to the previous years. And in, the, in this point, uh, Chris Seppala, he suggests uh, a test to verify whether the preconditions to arbitration have been uh, complied with. And the test is very simple. Uh, in the case of a DAB, the test is that uh, one should see whether the decision of the DAB also applies to the counterclaim, even if it's called a set-off claim. If it does, no problem, we move forward. If it does not, then the claims should be considered inadmissible, whether they are called counterclaims or set-off claims. The issue of set of claims can also be problematic on, on the context of a set of claims based in more two or more arbitration agreements. We know that when uh, different contracts related to the same project contain uh, different arbitration agreements, it's reasonable to consider that the party's intention was that each arbitrate each of these arbitration clauses should apply only to its own contract. So the general idea is that the Sony Materia extension of one arbitration agreement to the other contracts should not be possible. And this is also true to claims disguised as set-off claims. This solution is based on the principle of uh, party autonomy and should not present uh, raise many issues in practice. But some tribunals, however, decide otherwise applying uh, a reasoning that is uh, questionable. Uh, one very good example is given by an ICC case where the parties had signed a joint investment agreement for the construction of a plant uh, for the processing of maize. This contract contained an ICC clause with a seat in Paris. Subsequently, the same parties signed a second contract for the purchase of equipment, and this contract contained ICC clause with a seat in Zurich. The same party signed a third contract uh, for the transfer of technology, now again containing an ICC arbitration clause sitting in Paris. So, among these three contracts, claimant starts an ICC arbitration in Paris on the basis of the joint investment agreement. Respondent presented what it's called to be set off claims on the basis of the two other contracts, the contract for the purchase of equipment and the contract for the transfer of technology. So the, naturally the question of whether the tribunal could analyze this so-called um, set of claims arose and it was decided by the actual tribunal on the basis of legal grounds and efficiency grounds. On the legal ground, the actual tribunal decided, and, and I quote, that uh, a set of claims is a form of extinction of two obligations of the same kind existing reciprocally between the two parties. By means of raising a set of claim, a party intends to discharge or reduce the claim of the opposite party. It must be distinguished from a counterclaim, which may be adjudicated independently from the main claim. The Abdul tribunals also indicated that their decision were based on the, the very old French principle of le juge de l'action et le juge de l'exception. Then they turn into some efficiency um, arguments. 
The, the first one was that the fact that all three contracts were closely connected made it, in the arbitrator's uh, words, evident and necessary that the set of claims based on each of the contracts be decided together by the arbitral tribunal. And then they went on to say, absent a clear indication that the party's real intention was to keep the three agreements totally separate from each other, the tribunal has to rule that the set of claims cannot be artificially segregated. In my view, the, the decision of this arbitral tribunal would be true or would be correct if the situations of the case were different. But the issue is that in that case, I think there was an original problem with the qualification of what constitutes a set of claim. Reading uh, the decision, what was called a set of claim by a respondent seemed to be, in fact, a new dispute that would have to be decided by the arbitral tribunal prior to any set of. Only after a decision on the merits of those disputes related to the other two contracts would the arbitral tribunal be in a position to see whether there was anything to be set off or not against claimants' claims. So it would seem that the qualification in that case of uh, what was set of claims was not uh, an accurate qualification. What the, arbitral, uh, uh, um, what the arbitral tribunal constituted under the joint venture agreement which had a seat in Paris should have questioned itself was, do I have jurisdiction to decide disputes under the contract for the purchase of equipment and under the contract for the supply, uh, the transfer of technology? Regarding the contract for the transfer of technology, similarly to the joint investment um, agreement, that contract contained an ICC clause in Paris. So this is a very classic, um, very classic scenario. We see that when we are in the presence of two connected contracts signed by the same parties and contain compatible arbitration agreement, it is reasonable to consider that the party's intention was that all these disputes uh, be decided together. But regarding the, the, the contract for the purchase of equipment, this was not the case. That contract clearly provided for arbitration in Zurich. So it, it's very hard for me to understand how an arbitral tribunal sitting in Paris can consider it has jurisdiction to decide a claim, may it be called set of claim, on the basis of a contract that clearly provides for arbitration sitting in Zurich. To my view, contrary to what was uh, uh, indicated in the arbitral tribunal's decision, this was a very clear indication that the party's intention was to keep these disputes separate. This is exactly why they have uh, provided for Paris and Zurich as the seat of the arbitrations. Otherwise, they would have chosen the same seat. In this arbitration, the elements would indicate that the arbitral tribunal could have considered that it had jurisdiction to decide disputes between the joint investment agreement and the contract for transfer of technology. The arbitral tribunal would decide the disputes on the basis of these two different contracts. And once it had the results, then it would see whether there was anything to be set off between the two uh, claims. However, as for the contract of the purchase for the purchase of equipment, the tribunal should have declined jurisdiction. And I, I understand this decision may, or this my position may leave a, a taste of uh, inefficiency, but this is the simple application or result of the parties or what the parties provide in their contract. And the party's choice or the party's autonomy, the result of what they chose in the contract should prevail over any argument of efficiency. But to conclude, uh, we see that in the context of complex construction arbitrations, the issue of set of claims can raise some uh, delicate issues that should be carefully analyzed by arbitral tribunals on a case by case basis, where I think there should be little doubt the set of claims should be admitted is when arbitrators are in the presence of a true set of claims. There is a claim to set off an already determined and liquid amount against the other party's claims. Thank you, Afal.
Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, I think we have a couple of more minutes for questions from the audience. But before that, let's discuss with the speakers, because the speakers have made their excellent presentations, but they haven't had the opportunity to comment on each other's presentation. So I think it's very useful for us to to give, you know, to, to open this dialogue. Let me start with uh, with Jane. Uh, Thank Jane. Would you like to comment on, on, on Rupert's initial presentation on, on technical and expert evidence? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I thought it was an excellent presentation, uh, extremely um, comprehensive uh, and very helpful. I, I had a couple of uh, comments. The, the first uh, concerns a circumstance where the parties, one of the parties, uh, where there's a tribunal of three, has chosen to appoint as their arbitrator, an arbitrator who has expertise in the relevant area. Uh, and I wondered, Rupert, whether you had experience of this. I, I, I can mention a war story. Um, where we did have that situation and it was the other side who who had appointed the um the tribunal member who wasn't a lawyer but but had the relevant expertise um and the tribunal member suggested uh that he should go away in a room with the two experts and discuss the issues and and come up with an agreement between them as to what what the answers were to the questions which caused us some alarm as you might imagine uh, and the chairman then who, who was a lawyer did step in and suggest that um, that that wouldn't be an appropriate course um, the, the second point I want to make before um, asking you if you've been in a similar situation um, is is that my strong view is that there is great advantage in having the issues that the experts are going to address agreed between the parties at an early stage, and also the nature of the expertise that is required. So you don't find that you, you get the expert reports and you have a situation of ships that pass in the night. Um, the, the, the other point is that I would very much favour the experts getting together, having a without prejudice meeting and producing a joint report. Uh, and, and in my experience, what unfortunately happens is that that part of the timetable is often squeezed as the, the timetable slips back, but the hearing dates are, are fixed uh, and you don't get a proper opportunity to pro properly consider the implications of that joint report. Uh, which may provide uh, um, an opportunity for the parties to settle the dispute before you're immediately starting the hearing. So those are my my thoughts on that. I don't know if you agree, whether you want to take it. Thanks, Jane. I think uh, Anderson Sadaf uh, has a story to, to share with us, right, regarding tribunal appointed experts. Yes. yes. So, so I was on a, on a tribunal, a three-member tribunal, and we appointed an expert, an accounting expert. And uh, the accounting expert in the report, I think that's where there's a very delicate, I think you really need to set out a very clear mandate for tribunal appointed experts, because they tend to sometimes, depending obviously entirely on the expert and how proficient and competent they are, but they sometimes tend to cross over into thinking that they are kind of an arbitrator, because in our case, what we saw was the accounting expert made comments on jurisdiction, which was entirely outside their mandate. And I think that's where, so we had to, the respondent picked up on that. You know, the claimant was not too bothered about it, but I think it's a very delicate balance. And when you have, especially when you have a tribunal appointed expert, just to explain to them that, you know, this is your role and this is what, which, is exactly what we did but still the accounting expert went a step further and we had to sort of disregard that portion of his report and just focus on his findings to do with the accounts and the actual investigation that he had done yeah that was sort of a little story there thanks a lot i think robert touched on that topic right the risk yeah. of delegating the decision making process to the to the expert uh, would you like to comment robert on that uh that yes uh, absolutely uh, 
I mean, I can understand why some experts might might do that, although I agree with Sadaf, it, it does give rise to these difficulties, because in some jurisdictions, it's quite common at, at court level for a judge to, in effect, delegate complex construction issues to a, a so-called expert who's appointed from a list, and they, in effect, decide much of the case, um, or the judge adopts what is then uh, recommended by that expert. Uh, so I, I think there is a sometimes cultural or, 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 or practice uh, difference um, going on. Um, coming back to Jane's um, interesting comments, um, yes, I have had similar examples of uh, experiences of, of so-called expert arbitrators, if we can call them that. Um, it seemed that in the past, arbitrators would tend to be um, engineers, architects, and so on. And, and, and that seems to be less the case now, except in my uh, experience. And arbitrators seem to be more and more primarily lawyers. Um, but when you do have an arbitrator who has that expert um, expertise, um, and clearly the answer is, is I think, to, have, to, to, to be as transparent as possible about what it is they bring to the party, and what, what it is they are uh, considering, um, so that so far as it is being taken into account by the tribunal as a whole, that ev everyone knows what it is. Even more important, of course, if that person is a sole arbitrator, then of course the parties need to know. Um, and then your other points, uh, uh, yes, I think, as, as you know from my presentation, lists of issues and meetings of experts, I think, are both good things and should be held as early as practically possible in, in arbitrations. Agreed. Thanks. Thanks, Rupert, for that. Uh, Sadaf, back to you. We have a question from the, from the audience. Uh, are there any possibilities to obtain prolongation claim and additional cost claim? This is what I understand from the question. So are there any possibilities to obtain prolongation claim and additional cost claim due to COVID? Most projects are being extended for six months or to a an year or more, and additional costs incurred like overhead and preliminaries. Do you have any comments on that? Thanks, Raphael. And thanks, Bindu, for the interesting and very, yeah, very, that's a very topical question. Um, it, it depends on what the contract says, and it depends on obviously the governing law of the contract. Now, just to give an example of a potential clause that you could bring a time and cost claim under. So for example, if you had your construction contract was based on the FIDIC Red Book 99, reason I keep referring to this is it's very commonly used in the UAE and the Middle East region generally. So you could, for example, say that there was a shortage of supply and labor, or there was a shortage in you know, getting your goods on site. But again, it really depends on the wording of the contract, because if I recall correctly, FIDIC says it has to be in an unforeseeable shortage. So you'd have to show that it was an unforeseeable shortage. And you, you could raise a time claim, an extension of time claim, but that particular provision under FIDIC does not allow you to claim cost. So it doesn't refer to a cost claim, but you can bring time. But that does not mean, now taking for example, if UAE was your governing law, that doesn't mean, that doesn't prevent you from bringing a cost claim because you could claim for damages under the UAE civil code. So it really depends on what your contract says in terms of extension of time claims and cost claims, but my, Number one thing would be just put in your notices, look at the contract carefully and put in all your notices and claims on time. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Saraf. Uh, Rupert, would you like to comment on the COVID issues discussions, uh, bo both the, the question that was raised and answered by Saraf and Saraf and Jane's presentations, if you will? Yes, um, I very much enjoyed the, the, the very detailed um, presentation from Sadaf and Jane, and are very fond of comparative law, uh, especially in the construction uh, context. Um, I, I mean, I guess one has to look at these issues when you're doing so internationally by distinguishing between those legal systems where there isn't uh, much, if, if any, uh, default force majeure type or hardship laws, as, 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 as Jane indicated, is in, in effect the position, for example, under English law and as I understand it, is the position under many uh, common law uh, systems and distinguish those from uh, legal systems such as the UAE, as, as Saraf was describing, um, where there are these default positions so that even if your contract makes no uh, provision or the contract makes inadequate provision, uh, you have some sort of fallback entitlement. 
Um, but whilst you have that division, I find in practice, certainly when you get into arbitration, that arbitrators generally have a preference for applying the words of, of the contract. Um, and if, if you have certainly inadequate provision, um, it, it'll take um, some efforts to persuade the arbitrators that they should look outside those words and apply uh, provisions such as, um, as Sadaf was describing under uh, UAE um, uh, article, uh, Civil Code Article 249. Um, I, I practice a fair bit in the Middle East and conscious that um, the Egyptian Civil Code is 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 is, is the, uh, often the, the parent, or if I put it that way, of many of the civil codes in the region, and their Article uh, 147 um, has similar uh, hardship rules, which have been tested and considered over time with many events happening on a scale similar uh, to this pandemic. But you have to search quite hard to find uh, cases uh, reported where there has been actual relief granted by the courts. And in some places like Jordan, I understand it's compounded by the fact that you're supposed to apply whilst it's happening. Um, you, you can't get relief, it seems, if you apply after the event. Um, so there are further difficulties uh, uh, applicable there. Um, the, the other thing I was going to say was, particularly then looking at the words of the contract, um, you're left interpreting phrases like government action, I think, a lot in the C-19 context. Obviously, many clauses refer to pandemic or epidemic. Um, you've got shortages sometimes being mentioned as well regarding people and materials. But the, the definition of government action or similar phrases, I think, is one that's going to be tested a lot under many contracts, uh, because in, in our various jurisdictions, we've seen governments reacting in different ways and saying things at various stages of the pandemic, which may or may not, first of all, count as government action under the contract. And then secondly, you're left to interpret quite what was being said, because uh, many of our governments, I think it's fair to say, have not been as clear from a legal point of view as we might hope when you're then getting involved in a dispute situation. So you're left with that double level of interpretation of the contract and what was actually being said at the particular time when you're trying to seek relief uh, under a contract. Thanks, Rupert. Now, Jane, back to you. Uh, would you like to comment on Gustavo's presentations regarding set of claims? particularly in the solvency context. Do you have any story to share with us? Yes, it, it, I found the presentation really interesting. I, I, indeed, I, I've been in the situations that you describe, which can be incredibly frustrating for one's clients um, when you know encountering these jurisdictional questions about what will be the definition of the dispute that will be referred on to arbitration. Um, but, but what I wanted to sort of bring to the party is a slightly different point, which is in relation to tiered dispute resolution um, in the English context, uh, where we have statutory adjudication, and I know other jurisdictions do now, including New Zealand, Australia, um, Singapore. Uh, and essentially, the parties have a, a right to take, party, uh, take disputes to adjudication. Uh, which is a fast track process resulting in a decision within 28 days with the expectation that if either party is not happy with the adjudicator's decision, they can go to litigation or refer the dispute to litigation or to arbitration. Uh, and there's been a recent case law in the Technology and Construction Court around the thought question of whether a party that is in insolvent liquidation can pursue its right to adjudication. Uh, and the case I have in mind went all the way to the Supreme Court, which was um, Bresco and Lonsdale. Uh, and essentially the insolvent contractor in that case wanted to pursue a claim for non-payment under an adjudication and at the first instance, the court decided that the adjudicator would have no jurisdiction. In the second, in the Court of Appeal, they decided, well, they would have jurisdiction, but there would be no point in carrying out an adjudication because it would be futile given the high unlikelihood of the adjudicator's decision being enforced because 
you don't enforce by summary judgment an adjudicator's decision against an insolvent company because it is seen as potentially interim only. Uh, and if you then went on to refer the dispute again in arbitration or litigation, then that decision could be overturned. Um, but the Supreme Court held that uh, the adjudicator would have jurisdiction and that questions around whether an adjudicator's decision would or would not ultimately be enforced by way of summary judgment uh, were matters which should be looked at at the enforcement stage and not at the primary stage of addressing whether the adjudication should proceed. Uh, and they held that the adjudication should proceed uh, because it's a statutory and contractual right. Um, interestingly, uh, the, the first example of an enforcement case then came back before Fraser, uh, Judge Fraser, who had been the judge at first instance in the Fresco case. And he very helpfully set out five principles that should be applied when considering whether to enforce an adjudicator's decision against an insolvent company. The, the essential point is that what the liquidator has got to do is to stump up security um, in order to be able to get the benefit of uh, a summary judgment and payment to the liquidator uh, of the sums awarded by the adjudicator. They've got to stump up security so that in the event that the decision is overturned, there is the prospect for the winning appellant to, to recover the money again. So I just thought that that, that, that is a, a, an, an interesting area and I know that there are ramifications for arbitration as well uh, in relation to those tricky points uh, around stage dispute resolution in the context of an insolvent company. Thanks, thanks Jenny, very thoughtful uh, insights. Uh, last question from the audience, I think that's for you Rupert, very quickly. On one of the cases that you mentioned, uh, do you know, has permission been given to appeal the judgment? Do you have that information with you? Uh, I, I've searched for it um, because some commentators have been speculating as to whether an appeal would be pursued. Uh, there is no public record that I've found uh, of permission to appeal being given, um, but partly because of C19, uh, C above, um, there are some delays uh, in the appeal processes um, here uh, at the moment, um, so it may be that it hasn't yet come through, um, but certainly from the point of view of the usual databases one checks, I, I have not found any uh, indication that permission to appeal has been granted, but that's not to say that it hasn't yet hasn't been sought um, and possibly even given, but not just not yet um, uh, published. So so that's, that's, that's afraid the, the current position, it's a relatively recent uh, judgment, I think, from about April uh, this year. So we should know quite shortly if that is going to be happening or not. Thanks, Rupert. Now, turning to you, Gustavo, do you have any questions to the other speakers or comments on their presentation? Thank you. I, I have a question for Jane and Sadaf. And absent any uh, provision in the force majeure clause, is it a given that COVID was a force majeure event? Or, or the force majeure nature of COVID could be disputed. And then a follow-up question is, let's say the force majeure clause provides for several uh, uh, facts that do not constitute force majeure event, among them global crisis. But the party to a contract was impacted by the global crisis that then claims that it, the force majeure event triggering the party's problem to perform the contract was not the global crisis itself, was COVID, which is a, which was the, the, the source of the global crisis and it was the force majeure event. And therefore, the fact that the force majeure event, uh, force majeure clause provides that global crisis is not a force majeure event would not limit their rights under the, under the law. The, have you seen this? uh scenario and what are your thoughts on jane um very very good questions um is it a given that um the covid19 is a force majeure event 
no, no, it's not a given. And, and that's in circumstances where a pandemic or disease is not one of the enumerated events. The approach under um, English law would be to, uh, to look at the enumerated events uh, and to see whether they give any guidance to how the sweep-up um, category should be treated. When I refer to the sweep-up category, what I mean is what you typically see in a force majeure clause is you'd have war, um, ionizing, um, radiation, uh, and then at the end of the enumerated events, you would see an any other event or circumstances beyond the reasonable control of the parties. But what the courts will do is have regard to the enumerated events when deciding the breadth or otherwise of that sweep up provision. On the second question that, that you raise, in circumstances where a civil commotion was expressly, uh, sorry, a civil uh, crisis, a global crisis was expressly referenced uh, and ex I understood your point was it was excluded, expressly excluded as an event of force majeure. Uh, I think <laughs> the question would be always, what was the proximate and dominant cause of the contractor's inability to perform. So if they were nevertheless able to point to something that was more proximate and immediate, such as a change in law, and say that is the event we're relying on, that is the immediate event, it may be that that event is brought about by the pandemic, but nevertheless, we are focusing on the fact that the government has said that our premises have to close, for example, uh, then it seems to me that there would be the basis for an argument. Um, but it would come down to these very fine questions of causation and proving the immediate and proximate cause of the inability to perform. Thank you, Jane. Sadaf, any comments? Any additional comments? Yeah, I'll just uh, quickly add, I think the UAE courts would take a very similar approach because they do, it, they very narrowly construe what is considered as force majeure and what is not. And as Jean very well explained that causation is a very important factor. And um, just the way, just the criteria, and if you look at the way the courts, so for example, it's not a pandemic, but when in 2008, when you had the global, when you had the recession, and a lot of uh, parties were arguing that oh, the recession is now a force majeure event, or so the courts didn't they dismiss those arguments? They were like, no, there is no, you know. So I think causation is a very important factor, and how the contract has defined force majeure and what it includes as force majeure is something that the courts would definitely look at before deciding that yes to grant relief. Right, thank you. Unfortunately, we do have to finish and conclude our panel. I would like to uh, thank all the organizers and, and thank also the speakers for this great discussions. I enjoyed a lot and I learned a lot today. Uh, just a, a final reminder for the audience, uh, panels three, four and the keynote speech will start at 2 p.m. London time and they are accessible through another link. I think you have you should have received this other link. And I think it's all for, for now. And thank you very much again for the speakers and the organizers. And I hope to see you soon again. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael, for your expert chairmanship. And thank, thank you to all the audience for, for joining. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.